But there was, in the section on the Holocaust, there was one matter that you wrote that seemed very surprising. And that was as regards um, collaborators. You wrote that scholars seem to say, or scholars maintain, that the percentage of collaborators in Ukraine was more or less the same as in other European countries, like France and Holland. So I, I find this astounding because of the enormity of the massacres. One would think there was a much greater percentage of collaborators. And just if I can just very quickly add on, can you say something or elaborate like after the war, under both the Soviets and independent um, Ukraine, were there any in investigations or trials of possible war criminals? Thanks. OK, thank you. Should we take another question? No questions? Yes, OK, go ahead, Ryan. Uh, my question uh, follows on something that uh, Professor Margotchi said. Uh, Margotchi, sorry. The, it concerns the so-called Ukrainian police, OK? There was uh, the, in every country that the Germans occupied, there was a police, OK? Now, my question is, who were these people? I mean, there were no Ukrainian police in Poland before <laughs> Poland fell apart. There was no very few ethnically conscious Ukrainians in the Soviet police. They were, would have been by, regarded by the Ukrainians as traitors. And of course, uh, uh, what then? I, I read once a book about uh, called Hitler's Willing Executioners. And uh, there, the author actually tells us who were the members of the Einsatzgruppen, the people who actually did the shooting. What's the question? The question is, what is there a source where one can look up, for example, the makeup of the so-called Ukrainian police, or more probably, properly, police in Ukraine? Okay. One more question for this round. Go ahead. Thank you. Jerry. As a, as a child of immigrant uh, from Poland, I uh, was brought up on a steady diet of anti-Ukrainian. And we know, and it's complicated, the amount of collaboration the Ukrainians did, but again, it's complicated because of their struggles to be an independent country. Uh, against another horrible dictator. So as a Jew, how am I to view this collaboration of the Ukrainians with the Nazis? And there was a great deal, obviously, but for different reasons. Okay, so I think our colleagues, as you like, whatever order. I thought we will be asked something about art. <laughs> about a great Ukrainian artist, Tatyana Yablonska, who is in the book. Or about literature and great Ukrainian poet, Lesia Ukrainka, also a woman, who is in the book. But let me get to difficult issues. First, all three questions are one question. All three questions touch upon a subject matter which is being researched, discussed, and debated as we talk about it. One of the most important and most interesting breakthrough in our understanding of the Holocaust was precisely in this subject matter. What I suggest doing, um, you can uh, follow what I'm saying and take notes. Well, if you don't take notes, oh, I would not fail you at the final exam. But. I do strongly recommend taking a book, uh, res relatively recent, which is edited by Wendy Lowy, a woman, and Ray Brandon, 
which is called Shoah in Ukraine. It is the first, the most comprehensive, and most interesting book on the subject matter in the English language. Available with excellent articles on collaboration, among other things. This book tells us something important about um, Einsatzgruppen and um, um, Hilfspolizei. So you, if you are interested, I just refer to the book. Second thing, I do think that everybody who is interested in this subject matter should take by all means and read recent book by Timothy Snyder called Black Earth. This book reminds us of, uh, of a very important thing. We cannot compare a collaboration of French in France, of uh, Dutch in Holland, um, of um, um, Italians in Northern Italy, once Northern Italy is occupied by Germany, uh, or Hungarians in Hungary. We cannot collaborate this to the collaboration of Ukrainians, Poles, Lithuanians, and Belarusians for a simple reason. Most Western European countries are there. Most public social institutions are there when the Nazis come and occupy the countries. When the Nazis come and occupy, when the Nazis come and occupy East Europe, Poland, Belarusia, Ukraine, Lithuania, Latvia, and Estonia are destroyed as states. There is no state, no state institution, no diplomatic corps. There is nothing there that you can call a state. So that is a very important factor in our understanding of why things happen and what actually happens and how it is intended. Three, Christopher Brown has a wonderful book where he discusses one particular uh, unit of policemen, mostly from Germany, rank and file Germans, who were made to do a dirty job of killing. And Christopher Browning, uh, who I am once in a while teaching back to back, says something very important in his article published in a volume edited by Peter Hayes and called Oxford Handbook in Holocaust Studies, which I believe is the absolute best handbook. Um, it's this thick, 50 articles, introducing you to each and every aspect of the Holocaust that has ever been published. Christopher Browning says, you will be amazed if you actually find out how little units, how little people it took to destroy, to kill, to massacre six million Jews. Jews tend to think that, you know, why the Nazis are doing that? Let's send these people to the front and they will be killing the Russians or, you know, the Americans when the second front is open. Actually, it takes very little effort. It doesn't take much in terms of uh, the wagons that are used to send uh, Jews to Treblinka, Majdanek, Auschwitz, and other places. It doesn't take many people to guard these places. So let's not talk about you know, the scale of collaboration, which is uh, proportional to the massacre. It doesn't work this way. And I, this is not what I'm saying. This is what the expert, the top expert in the field is saying. And he is not Jewish, so I respect him more than my Jewish colleagues. It's a joke. The most important research in this issue of collaboration was actually done by a young scholar from Kharkiv whose name is Yuri Ratchenko. He published just a couple of articles, and I heard his presentation in Kharkiv at an international conference, Jews in the Multi-Ethnic Mosaic of Ukraine in 1914. Um, Ratchenko asked the question which was asked today. Who were the people who made Hillspolizei in Ukraine? And he found out an astounding thing. One word, Hillspolizei was not an ethnic group. It was a geographical group. That is to say, Hillspolizei, Ukrainian Hilfspolizei, Ukrainische Hilfspolizei in German documents is a group of people which is drafted in Ukraine. And that's it. And it has a huge amount of Vlasovtsi of the Russian soldiers who defected to the German side. We absolutely forget that 1.5 million, 1 million Russian soldiers were fighting for the Third Reich armies during the Second World War, defecting from the Russian side or, you know, from the Soviet side. So, sorry, thank you. 
So there were Vlasovci, Russian soldiers, Soviet soldiers, former Soviet soldiers. There were Hungarians. There were Poles. There were, yes, Ukrainians. There were also Belarusians. So Ukraine, Ukraine Shahil's Polizei is not necessarily an ethnic Ukrainian group, something extraordinary that we have to understand. Rachinka, Snyder, Browning, Lowy, Brandon. These are people who help us understand what is going on. What I'm conveying to you right now is not my research, is my reading. I very strongly recommend folks, read the books. They are existing there on the shelves of the Roberts Library for you to take them and to read them. On the word collaboration, which has become, I think, uh, a word that's very emotive. And uh, I think sometimes it, it makes us forget you know, what the essence of what we're talking about. So let me just pose uh, rather controversially, if you were in Western Ukraine, in former Austrian Galicia, uh, when did the collaboration of populations start? So the elite, the elite of that society tried to set up a state, they failed. And then they wound up in a Polish state in which everyone who wanted to keep their job had to betray the national cause and take an oath. Anyone who wanted to stay in Poland and have a job of that elite had to betray the Ukrainian cause and collaborate with the Polish regime. And then in 39, the Soviets came. And contrary to what Professor Darevich said, there were, I think there were many Ukrainians who served in the Soviet police who were local Ukrainians. Uh, in villages, they did, they, they, they had support. But for many of them, it was their second collaboration. And then the Germans came in, in 41. What I'm trying to say is it was a very different story from the Netherlands, right? Where you had a national state, most people were loyal to this state, the state was destroyed by the Germans and Nazis, and then you collaborated with the victorious Nazis. Because you were not betraying your state which didn't exist, or you were, and you had also a population. Now, we may find out, we tend to, to, to emphasize the ON and the groups who don't collaborate with the Polish state, it, largely. But in, in when we discuss our struggle, there are those who don't, and they become part of the story. But it makes the whole issue of collaboration a, a much more complex issue in, in, in Ukraine and in much of Eastern Europe than in Western Europe. 